As you've heard, I'm one of those uh, academic faculty members who has a litany of, of, of professional titles that go on and on and on. I'm actually both the professor of surgery and bioengineering at Harvard, and I'm the founding director of the Wyss Institute for Biologically Inspired Engineering. But I, I've never been trained in surgery, and I've never taken an engineering class in my life. Uh, <laughs> I uh, also, you heard that my creations have been in art museums, but I, I'm not an artist either. So how did I get here? Well, it, it actually uh, all started in a sculpture class uh, when I was undergrad, and I decided to take an art class even though I was a science major. And one day, a professor in the art class walked in with a structure much like this toy, that is made out of a series of elastic strings that are interconnected with a series of rigid struts. Now, if the strings were not connected to the sticks, they'd just be like a pile of, like a pile of strings like a spider web cut from tree branches. But because the sticks push out on the strings and the strings pull on the struts, it establishes a state of isometric tension, a force balance that gives it shape just the way my arm creates a force balance through muscles and, and, and bones through the tone or tension in my muscles so that I can be stiff or, or flexible. It's exactly the same in this structure. Now, this structure is called tensegrity because of coined from the term tensional integrity uh, because it's different than most man-made buildings that use compression of like one brick on top of another to give you stability. Now, in that class, the teacher uh, started to flatten this structure on his desk, and then he pulled it flat, and then he released it. And that got my attention, because, and, and this is a true story, that same week, just a few days before, I was learning how to culture cells at, at Yale Medical School, and um, cells, when, you, when they attach to a rigid dish, spread and flatten, as do their little nuclei right at the center. They're flat like a pancake. However, if you want to pass it from dish to dish, you have to clip the anchors, and when you do that, they spontaneously retract and jump up off the dish, just like, just like that model. Now, this was the mid-1970s, and people tend to think of cells as sort of water balloons filled with molasses. But uh, just about the same time, people had found that the cells have a molecular skeleton. And this is actually made up of actomyosin filaments that are the same ones that create tension in our muscles. So to me, it was obvious, cells are tensegrity structures. So I, I told that to the scientists I were working with, and they thought I was absolutely nuts. And basically said, don't say that again. <laughs> and that was, as I say, was the beginning of the rest of my life. Uh, so um, I then went and built my own models that are this high. I use aluminum struts and shock cord from a sailboat. I then built a nucleus out of sticks and struts. I connected it to the cell surface by black elastic string you can't see. And now when it spread, the cell and nucleus spread, and when it rounded, they did the same, just like we saw in living cells. Now, it took many years, but eventually I was able to show that, in fact, tensegrity is literally the architecture of life. It, is, it governs how cells and tissues and molecules and our bodies are constructed. Now, the other thing, at just about the, the same time, people found that this is more than a skeleton. It orients most of the cell's biochemical machinery, which made me think that perhaps cells can be controlled, their function, mechanically. And my idea to test this was that the way cells spread and change their shape is by sticking, pulling, and flattening, and flattening, and flattening. And then if there's no resistance, they stop. So the idea was, if I can make little adhesive ions like this red dot I'm on, the size of a cell, then if I had a big circle, the cell would spread, flatten, and take the shape of a pancake. But if I made a smaller one, it would be a cupcake. And if I made a tiny one, 
it would be a golf ball on a tee. And thus, if I saw changes in function, I could say that it was controlled by stretching or changes in mechanical forces. But how do you fabricate something on the size of a single cell? The answer to that came from computer microchip manufacturing, which creates features on the same scale of living cells. So when we did this, we found that the pancake-shaped cells actually grow and proliferate when, in the presence of chemical factors that normally stimulate growth. But in the same chemical medium, if you are a golf ball on a tee, you commit suicide, the cell commits suicide, and dies. And we used cells from our blood vessels, from the capillary blood vessels for these studies, and if we held them to a moderate degree of stretching by putting them on lines, they spontaneously form capillary blood vessels in a dish with a hollow lumen down the center. So basically, we're able to show that mechanical forces are as important as chemicals and genes. Now, this is about the same time, it was not about the same time, it's actually years later, that uh, in, in 2009, when I founded the Wies Institute for Biologically Inspired Engineering at Harvard University. Now, most of you know that engineering has transformed medicine over the past 50 years by taking engineering principles and trying to solve medical problems. Hip implants, uh, pacemakers, insulin injectors, these are just a few examples, and it goes on and on. Imaging. The institute was formed based on the belief that we've actually now uncovered about how nature builds, controls, and manufactures from the nanoscale up, that we're now in a position where we could actually leverage biological principles to develop new engineering innovations. This is what we call biologically inspired engineering. And we were lucky enough to get kick-started with the single largest philanthropic gift in Harvard's history of $125 million, which we've doubled and tripled since then. Now, uh, to get that kind of money, well, we, had, we were tasked with taking on really high-risk, high-impact problems that could change the world for the better. The biggest problem that I could see at the time was that the drug development model is broken. This is because it, it, it costs $3 billion or more to go from discovery to FDA approval of a drug. It takes an incredible amount of time. Problems in the, in the process are that they do a lot of the studies with cells on those plastic dishes that are nothing like in our body, and they often don't predict what's going on. They have to do animal studies required by the FDA. They're expensive, they're time consuming, there are innumerable ethical issues, but the real problem is that they're wrong more often than not. More than 70% of drugs fail when they reach humans, and that's why costs are so high, and, and it, it's a problem worldwide. So we set out to develop a model of human organs that could actually replace animal testing. We started with the lung. You, you probably all know we have lungs, where we breathe. A uh, major functional unit is called the air sac or alveolus. This is where you have gas exchange, where you have airborne particulates and smog that irritate your lungs or pneumonia or metastasis to the lung. It's actually a relatively simple structure. It's a hollow bag. If you go to a very high magnification and you cross-section it like, a, like you'd slice a piece of bread, you can see in this image that there's air, there's one layer of lung cells, there's a matrix they anchor to, in your body, called extracellular matrix. And on the opposite side of the same matrix is your capillary blood vessel cell, and then blood. But what it doesn't show is that it's incredibly mechanically active in that you breathe in, you breathe out, the cells stretch, the air flows in, the blood is moving all the time. So if we're trying to build a model of a, of a lung, of a whole human organ, we have to distill down to the most fundamental design principles. And here, what makes an organ different than a tissue or a cell is that it involves two or more tissues interfacing, coming together, and new functions emerge, emerge and it almost always has a blood vessel to bring oxygen and nutrients. So we needed a tissue-tissue interface. And then, as I told you, I, one of the principles we had uncovered is that mechanical forces have to be integrated in this model. It can't be a rigid dish. So what we created is what we call a human lung on a chip. It's a small device made out of a optically clear, flexible rubber that has tiny channels lined by living human cells. We call it a lung on a chip because we use that same microchip manufacturing method I described to create these tiny, tiny features. Now, this next slide will allow you to get a feel of what happens inside it. So, if you 
cut this in cross-section, you'll see that it's made up of three hollow channels in parallel, each less than a millimeter wide. The middle one has a very thin membrane with pores, so it splits top and bottom. To create a model of the lung air sac, we put human lung air sac cells on top, human lung capillary blood vessel cells on bottom. We just recreated that tissue-tissue interface. It's called the alveolar capillary interface. Then the trick is that we have ch side channels, we apply a cyclic vacuum. It's all flexible, so it stretches and retracts at the same rate and degree as our lung cells experience in our lungs when we breathe. We can then put air over the top, just like in the lung, and we could flow medium with or without immune cells or whole human blood if we put the capillary cells on all four sides. Now, if this were to work, it should mimic organ level response. So imagine you have an infection like a bacteria, pneumonia. What happens is the tissue in the airspace puts out signals that stimulate the blood vessel cells to capture circulating white blood cells that normally just flow by but now they get activated, they capture, they migrate, they go to the other side and they engulf. And that's how we protect ourselves from infection. So now I'm gonna show you imaging in the device. And you could do any imaging you could do in a dish or in a body. Those are fresh human white blood cells. I, I know they're fresh, we took them out of my postdoc. Um, <laughs> and the, it, you can't see the capillary cells and behind the screen are the lung cells. Begin, begin with, it's healthy, it flows by, but now we stimulate it with bacteria and that they, they spontaneously pull the cells out of flow that stick to the surface. Now we can do higher magnification imaging. You're gonna see one cell, it sticks, it finds a space between two endothelial cells right here, and then it goes under, finds that pentagonal hole in the membrane, it wiggles its rear end out of focus as it goes through the matrix, and then it you see it now coming out the other side, and now I'm gonna show you the white blood cells in red, because we have the bacteria labeled in green and now you will see them being engulfed. So you just watch the entire human inflammatory response in this little rubber chip. This got people's attention. So we went on and on. We now have 20 different organ chips. This is a lung airway where the mucus moves and the cilia move them. This is an intestine that have peristalsis and an intestinal villi form. We have shown that in every one of these we could mimic human physiology, human disease states, we can grow complex microbiome in the intestine chip if we have flow, and mechanical forces are absolutely critical for, to, to reconstitute human level functions. Now, when I first did this uh, a number of years ago, be, because we have that blood vessel channel, I suggested that we could create a human body on chips. Because imagine if we link flow from one to the other, you can imagine putting an oral drug through the, the lumen of the intestine chip, just like you're eating it, and then it would be absorbed, and you can measure how it's broken down by the liver chip and peed out by the kidney chip, and whether you have toxicity on your heart, and what does it do to bone marrow function, for example, or an aerosol drug there. And amazingly, this Monday, we have two papers coming out that show that we actually now have done this, where we have linked um, multiple organ chips, and we can quantitatively predict drug levels over time in humans using this little simple system, which you cannot do in animal studies. And so this is really transforming how people are going to be developing drugs because we could make chips for your lung or your liver and test the drugs that work for you. And we can test small populations of people with genetic problems and just develop drugs for that group and use them for clinical trials. And I think this is really going to increase the likelihood of success, decrease the time and really change the way things work. Now, everything I told you about is about technology. But there's, this is also an example of design, which is really about creating solutions, doing more with less. And our organ on chip, we're very proud in that it has a very elegant design. That is our patent drawing from our patent, which has been issued. Um, but we also, just to, you know, the symmetries we use, the clarity of the device, it has a sort of a crystalline, elegant simplicity to it that is visually beautiful as well. But we were kind of blown away when we won the International Design Award and Product Design Award in 2015, issued by the London Design Museum, which I am extremely proud of. And a few months later, it was acquired by the Museum of Modern Art in New York for their permanent collection, which kind of was over the top. Um, <laughs> 
I am most proud of the International Design Award. My, my wife is most impressed with MoMA because I'm now a permanent member, which means I get a discount at the gift shop <laughs> for the rest of my life. Um, as you can see, it's also been in many public exhibitions, MoMA, around the world, uh, Paris, London, Copenhagen, Israel, the Middle East, etc. Now, even the tensegrity model is an example of design of a, uh, of the problem was, you know, how are cells built? And, and we really got, in, I got insight through design. And this full circle has come to a close uh, this past year where um, we, there's a major collection, uh, exhibition at the Cooper Hewitt Smithsonian Design Museum in Manhattan. Um, one part of it, the Nature Triangle just closed. The other part that's called the Wies Institute Selects exhibition is open till March. Um, and it, we had five different Wies Institute technologies, um, actually none of them being organs on chips, one of them being mine in the triennial. And in the Wies Institute selects, we really go throughout uh, the whole world as well as our institute technologies and, and, and designs. But the key point is that the artist community are, are coming to work with scientists and engineers. They're coming now to look for collaborations because they see that we're facing enormously large problems that in terms of water, environment, sustainability. And I invite you to, to come to those collections because it's really absolutely wonderful because they're looking to nature for design solutions because nature does it best. So to end, I, I just bring the, you back to where I started, which is, this is a quote by Buckminster Fuller, inventor of the geodesic dome, but also coined the word tensegrity. And he said that nature has no separate departments of biology, physics, chemistry, or art. And it's true. We're taught in a channelized way, but that's not the way the real world works. And if I've learned anything in my life, is that the real breakthroughs happen when you, when you blast through boundaries between these disciplines. And I hope all of you out there, whether you're students or you're at work, that you, you do the same and just think, how can I get outside the box and really think, how do I come up with something that really can make a difference? So thank you so much.